It's good to see everyone again in day two of the symposium. Uh, so first, let me just say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We Yesterday, we had uh, somewhere between 60, 65 to approaching 90 participants, participants from, I think, almost every continent. And it was just so ex exciting to see so much interest. Uh, there, there is more interest in this topic than I had anticipated. My inbox is absolutely overflowing with emails, including a very interesting specific emails about uh, certain images that were shown in yesterday's presentation. So I just want everyone to know that we will begin responding, or at least I'll begin responding to emails probably uh, late tomorrow afternoon, my time here in the Western US. So today we have another extremely exciting lineup of scholars. Uh, I expect that we'll end uh, a little bit earlier today. We've scheduled to 12.15. Yesterday we went to 12.35 uh, because of the robust discussion. Uh, but today we have three really exciting presenters. Professor David Wong uh, will be a, the first presenter. His respondent will be Professor Daryl Ireland. The second uh, uh, presenter is Professor Joseph Ho, and his respondent will be Professor Amy O'Keefe. Then uh, Professor uh, uh, Robert Carboneau, a passionist, uh, who, is, who is the archivist for a really impressive collection of images of, of China, that mostly in the 1930s and 40s, I think even maybe into the 50s. Uh, will speak. His respondent will be Professor Christy Chow. And then tomorrow will be our keynote speaker, Professor Nancy Steinhardt. Uh, what an exciting lineup. Uh, so excited. Uh, tomorrow, after Professor Steinhardt's discussion, we hope to, uh, her presentation, we hope to have uh, uh, some time for an open discussion. I'll be prepared with a few uh, uh, a few recommended discussion topics, but but we'll open it up. Today, please make sure your mute is on. And also, if you if you have a question, feel free to leave that in the chat. Uh, uh, my wife, Dr. Amanda Clark, and I will be uh, sort of co collaboratively uh, monitoring those questions, and I'll be moderating questions. Certainly, if there's time after the respondent and the presenter uh, have their dialogue, uh, we'll open up for questions after each presentation, if possible. Just either raise your hand, I think somewhere in the participants area, there's a way to raise your hand, or, or uh, if I open up the floor, uh, just unmute and, and begin. Well, the other thing I should say, and the, the last thing I should say before uh, Dr. Wong begins, and that is, um, it's difficult for me because I know here in, in the United States, people pronounce his name Wang. And uh, as someone who speaks Chinese, uh, I'm always a little loath to, in, in a way, pronounce it in the American pronunciation. But uh, these presentations will all be recorded and available for scholarly consultation. Uh, hopefully by mid-May, late May, they will be available. They'll be available to the presenters and respondents first, and then they will eventually be available uh, through Whitworth University for anyone to consult, especially if they're a scholar. And uh, hopefully they are the beginning of what will become a very robust academic line of study. Uh, this important uh, part of China's architectural legacy is just now gaining a lot of currency. So with that, let me uh, introduce, and I'm keeping introductions very simple. Let me introduce uh, Professor David Wong to uh, present and his respondent will be Dr. Uh, Daryl Ireland. Professor Wong. Good morning. Could you all hear me? Um, first, thanks goes to, um, let me just get this right. First, uh, thanks goes to my friend and colleague, Dr. Anthony Clark. And uh, Tony, you're right. My, I am, my, my family name is Wong. In fact, my, my Chinese name is Wang Yuansung, Wang Yuansung, meaning that I was born on Chinese New Year's. Um, so that will be with me for the uh, rest of my life. Anyway, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you, Tony, for um, asking me to do this. Uh, thank you ahead of time to Dr. Ireland too. I'm looking forward to your uh, comments uh, afterwards. 
and we are here to discuss and talk over uh, Celso Constantini's uh, charge to Dom Adelbert Greshnik. And I took very careful notes on how to pronounce his name from the experts yesterday, but I'm just going to say it like I read it. Um, Constantini's charge to Greshnik to, um, uh, you know, we have to enter into the spirit of this Chinese architecture and enliven it with a new Christian life. I shall be happy if your architects succeed in, in creating such models. So I was into this uh, literature for a couple of weeks before I read Dr. Kuhlman's chapter on, on this material. And I found out from Dr. Kuhlman's, uh, uh, beside the fact when I found out from him yesterday that Reshtik may, may not have read these articles, but we'll, have wrote, written these articles, but we'll set that aside for a little bit. That uh, Constantini was convinced that only natives were able to express the deep Chinese soul. Well, Western artists could only, could only produce Chinasuli. Regarding architecture, however, he could not find an authentic Chinese architect. And I was blown away because it was not until then that I realized that Greshnik was, as uh, Dr. Kuhlman says, neither a missionary nor an architect. And having seen his work and pictures of his work, I just think this guy did a great job. I mean, um, but at any rate, uh, when I read this um, and I was into this material, I said to myself, gosh, I wish I was around, I'd apply for that job. And I, I, I am a authentic, I mean, I, you know, I am an authentic Chinese architect and um, uh, would certainly have relished the opportunity to translate some of these, um, um, uh, ideas into, into um, architectural form. A little bit about me. I practiced architecture for many years before I went into um, academia. In fact, uh, 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 the, um, um, yes, I, I, when I went into architecture, I didn't, I didn't know that um, I would enter into academia. And uh, Dr. Steinhardt, I'm, I'm a product of Penn. Uh, architecture School and Penn Architecture School, of course, uh, as she knows very well, plays a very prominent role in, um, in uh, 20th century American architecture. What I have done in academia is to teach architectural theory. And my um, research interest has been to take pre-enlightenment ideas and retrieve them to, uh, as a means to critique current theories of material culture. Uh, and all out of that has come two books, one on the philosophy of Chinese architecture, past, present, and future. And uh, the, the other book that just came out last year is Architecture and Sacraments. So I'm interested in these pre-enlightenment ideas, both East and West. And so uh, understanding Constantini's charge to uh, Greshnik, I, how would a Chinese Christian architect, and this is another thing about me that is germane to this conversation, I've been a, a Christian, uh, and I, reading this material reminded me that I'm a Chinese Christian um, all of my life. Um, all of my life I've attended, I've attended Chinese churches, uh, either directly as a young uh, man uh, or relatedly all my life. And my wife and I currently uh, attend a Chinese church uh, where I actually speak from the pulpit once a month. So as a Chinese Christian architect and as an academic retrieving ancient ideas to critique current material culture, how would I respond to the Greshnik, um, the Constantini Greshnik task? I mean, this is obviously a, a ton in cheek, but um, I, I do relish the opportunity to think through uh, this material from, from uh, not only an academic point of view, but, but from an architectural one as well. Uh, the title of my topic, is, my talk is Architecture of Spirit and Chi. Is it one style or two? And just to spend a slide on this, uh, um, what, what do I mean by this? Well, uh, I, I'm, what I mean is by this very elegant phrase that I'm going to put on the screen here, um, it is what it is. Um, and what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that is that spirit has been completely co-opted by Hegelian notions of an eminent communal Geist, so much so that the spirit of God who has been poured out 
in relation to general cultural development is not noticed at all. And I may have rephrased this had I, had I heard uh, Dr. Stephanie Wong's talk yesterday, uh, which I also was very um, happy to, to hear. Um, it seems like she's dealing with this uh, in, in, in the terms of incarnation. And, uh, and, and that's, a, uh, that's an idea very close to my heart uh, in moving forward for uh, the Christian church, there's got to be a way in which uh, the, the pouring out of the spirit of God understood as an incarnational presence uh, really needs to be connected with issues of material culture um, in order to, to um, move Christian understanding forward, I think. Um, on the Protestant side, you hardly get any um, uh, work on this matter of how incarnational presence in, informs the um, material culture. On the Chinese side, qi as the primordial stuff of all things is also a creative culture shaping force. You probably see this clearly in, in mentions of the early philosophers, but it really is a general assumption in the I Ching and feng shui principles, which as you all know, as we all know, these uh, aspects, Yi Jing and Feng Shui, these are not the uh, purview of any particular Chinese philosophical school. It's just Chinese, we, it, it's just being Chinese. And, um, but Qi is a creative culture shaping uh, force. What I mean to say then is that authentic architecture always arises internally out of the percolations of a culture spirit or Qi. And I take this to be Greshnik's vivifying principle and Again, Dr. Wong yesterday looked at this uh, matter of genius uh, in uh, architectural theory. Of course, we have uh, this notion of genius loci, the spirit of place. One place is genius loci is not the genius loci of another place. The other fine principle. So I, 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 authentic architecture always arises internally out of the percolations of a culture's spirit or chi as they express themselves in material culture. This sounds Hegelian. Uh, but the difference is that I understand both spirit and chi as the productive presence of the God of the cosmos as culture finds expression in material ways. So what do I mean by it is what it is? Well, I'm gonna sound a little uh, Thomist here, but this is what I mean by it. Uh, it. It is what it is. This embraces the allowance of potentiality into actualities as itself an expression of the creative spirit of God in human cultures. And this is neither a Western nor an Eastern operation, but a single universal reality. So again, to quote my um, new colleague, Stephanie Wong, something she said yesterday, uh, God is a player in this. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is something that I, at least for me and my work on material culture and ideas uh, is never too far away from uh, from not only a, a factor, but the factor in how we understand material culture moving forward. I'm gonna um, now present to you two very large theoretical frames, both of which, uh, in which I will situate the concerns of this symposium. Uh, one theoretical frame is, um, for lack of a better term, the history of architecture. Um, and the other theoretical frame, uh, the history of ideas. And so these are very broad uh, uh, frames that I hope to do in a couple of slides. And then, but uh, trust me, I'll try to uh, situate the Greshnik, uh, Constantinian Greshnik conversation, as well as modernity in Chinese architecture in, this, uh, in these frames. Greshnik's vivifying principle for Chinese architecture. Um, in the West, what has been vivifying principles for architecture? Well, in 1975, Alexander Zarnas and Leanne Lefay uh, proposed two vivifying principles, uh, which they claim stretched all the way from the classical period to, uh, well, to 1975. When they were writing this, there were just two vivifying principles for Western architecture. One, uh, and so they called it epiphore. And epiphore 
is a physical object that captures the vivifying principle motivating the design of a building. So I'm, I'm sort of digesting their much more, their longer definition for what an epiphore is for purposes of our conversation today. Uh, an epiphore in their idea is a physical object that compare, ca captures the vivifying principle motivating the design of a building. The first epiphore they identified is of course the human body. Uh, buildings as human bodies, um, Vitruvius was mentioned yesterday. Uh, the human body has been the, uh, the sort of organizing principle, the epiphore, the vivifying principle for Western architecture ever since the um, classical, classical era. It was not until the uh, 18th, 19th century that the second epiphore appeared, which is the um, machine. The machine became the vivifying principle for architecture. Uh, this Eiffel Tower here, this is not a human body, this is a machine. Uh, and just to uh, underline the tremendous difference between these two ideas and how they are expressed in architectural form. Take a look at the scale differences of these two um, epiphores when they're expressed uh, by architecture. Uh, the scale difference is staggering. And um, my point is that this difference came out of internal changes in the, in the spirit of culture moving through the centuries in the Latin West. And no, no, nobody from the outside came in to bring these ideas in. Um, the, uh, uh, certainly nobody from China came in to bring, uh, to bring these in. That would be a real reversal for some, somebody can write a novel about that. Um, it's certainly not history. Uh, it's the nature of the West to go out and to tell others uh, about ideas, never the other way around. Um, but here you see uh, how ideas tremendously impact form from the inside from cultural percolations internal to the development of these ideas. One of the things that I've contributed to the literature is to propose uh, the idea that in our lifetimes, there has emerged a third epiphore, a third vivifying principle. Take a look at this building, which is already old. This is the uh, Experience Music Project in uh, Seattle. This building uh, is not a human body. Uh, and we're glad it isn't. Uh, this building is on a machine. This building answers to another vivifying principle, which is what I call this, a cybercomputer epiphore. And if you look at the, uh, the bottom diagram, that's a diagram of uh, the internet uh, globally. You see all these strands and uh, amorphous um, connections. And this stuff is swimming now through us. It's not just around us, it's through us. It's an energizing factor, um, a culture shaping factor that for some of us older ones, uh, we, we know that we can feel the difference. We can feel the machine epiphore pretty much going in the background and uh, the younger generation living and imbibing a kind of um, uh, epiphoric vivifying principle that is uh, frankly a, a little uh, too new for some of us older ones. Um, so take a look at this. This is uh, actually a computer diagram of the um, uh, cell phone activity at, at a given moment over Rome's Termini station. Um, look at those strands that, that we don't see, but are everywhere in our current world, flowing everywhere, going through us as well. And then take a look at this, uh, take a look at the strands on this building. Um, th this is not a human body. Uh, this is not a machine. This is the, uh, uh, the cyber computer epiphore. Now, Granted, this was done by a, a, a European firm, Herzog de Meuron. But my point is precisely that this is the first globalized epiphore, the first globalized vivifying principle. And I argue in um, chapter seven of my book on the Chinese philosophy and architecture, that this is an opportunity 
for East and West to meet because the technical terms in both um, um, streams of philosophy, many of them can meet up in this, uh, in this epiphore. Strands flowing through us. Um, so this is the inside of that uh, bird's nest uh, during the Olympics. This is the uh, uh, computer cyber networks. If we want to um, consider elements of uh, sublimity, which uh, through centuries of Christian history, the Gothic cathedrals gave us uh, all sorts of Christian, uh, all sorts of art and architecture in the West uh, was focused on, on sublimity. If we wanna talk about sacramental participation, uh, if we want to uh, look at, uh, consider uh, the next 500 years, I'm thinking of Phyllis Tickle's the, the Great Emergence, How Christianity is Changing and Why. Um, she proposes that uh, every 500 years, the, the church rejuvenates itself and takes on new looks. Uh, we're 500 years from Luther and uh, things are happening in our lifetime. And so uh, I know that this is most this conference is mostly historians, but I think a, a worthwhile uh, uh, awareness that historians and all of us should have is as all scholars should have as we look at existing or past conditions, it is of course what those conditions portend for, for us moving, moving forward. And I know in the architecture realm, it has been come, this computer epiphore has completely revised how, um, how we think of architecture and architecture design globally. So my point is that the next uh, moving forward, uh, a Chinese church, uh, a Christian church in China may look something like this. Uh, this of course is not a church. This is the Shenzhen airport. But uh, what I've argued in, 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 um, in published works is that this is the first time in this computer uh, epiphore that we lose ornamentation. What I mean by that is that the, the or, what we would call ornamentation, for example, in the Gothic cathedrals, they did not consider it ornamentation. They considered it essential. And the Roman orders, uh, they would not have known what you mean by or, uh, decoration or ornamentation because each of the orders um, were essential. And the cyber computer epiphore brings us appearances in which in the machine epiphore would be decoration. But in the computer epiphore, the essence of a building comes back to you in ways that again, through machine eyes, may look like decoration, but it isn't. It, it, it touches back on matters of essentiality of being. So let's go back to, speaking of decoration, let's go back to our epiphores. One thing that happened with the machine epiphore is the emergence of architecture as decoration. Here's uh, Walpole's Strawberry Hill. Uh, and he did his uh, mansion in Gothic revival, Gothic revival. In other words, he took a he took a box essentially, and made it look Gothic. This was a innovation of the uh, the Industrial Revolution, which never occurred to architectural theory before this. Uh, the the idea that we can take something and decorate it regardless of its essentiality. We can make it look like anything we want. Uh, and of course, um, uh, Robert Venturi made this idea of decoration, the another pen, uh, in fact, he was there when I was there, um, uh, made this idea of decoration, the regulating uh, basis for Postmodern architecture, architecture at decorated sheds, cosmetic architecture, stage set architecture is what architecture be has become. Quite devoid of any kind of essential essence um, or identity, um, 
a building might have. So I want to now show you this uh, structure. This is in Wuhan. Um, you might think that this is a Gothic Christian cathedral. It is not. It is a box decorated to look like a Gothic cathedral. It is a event center in a sector of Wuhan, uh, which has completely been changed into a stage set of European experiences. Um, so I think we've got to sort of take this decorative aspect into our conversation regarding um, um, church architecture of any variety uh, in China or anywhere else. Uh, we've got to situate it in time, situate it in what technology has, has brought to us, good and bad, uh, and its impact on the way we think about architecture. I mean, I was in this building. Um, what you'll find is that other than the, the event center on the ground floor, everything else is just decoration. I mean, and the Chinese uh, do it better than most of us. I mean, it, it's um, for reasons that I will, I will say in, in the next frame. So this is the next frame. Let's talk about a, a large graph of ideas and situate the Constantini Gresham conversation in it. Um, if you, let's distribute, uh, uh, let's put this on a timeline and let's distribute our epiphores as playing cards uh, on these quadrants. Um, for example, the, uh, the Eiffel Tower, you, you need propositional uh, knowledge, you need fixed equations to be able to do this kind of thing. Um, and uh, as I will uh, return to Greshnik, I mean, the Chinese vivifying principle, there's only been one, which is, uh, which is nature. And we'll talk a little bit about what that can mean for Chinese architecture, clearly in the past, but also moving forward in a bit. Uh, if you did this, a green bubble uh, uh, illustrates where Chinese ideas were in ancient times. It was clearly fluid, the poetic, the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. I mean, what do you do with that? I mean, it's uh, once you name it, once you propositionalize it, it ain't the Tao. So I mean, it's it's fluid. Uh, it's uh, it's poetic. Uh, you might say the Confucian views, uh, the Confucian protocols were a little more poetic. But as we all know, those protocols, the the Li, uh, were practiced so that. Um, we could become like nature, you know, Confucius says uh, in the Analects, you know, by the time he's, he's 60, he could do whatever he wanted without trespassing the mean. I mean, so the virtue of the sage is, a, is, is something that's inherent in nature. And um, if I had it, if I had this du, uh, all my students would revolve around me and I would be the pole star. It's a, it's a moral causality uh, that is embedded in the fluidity of nature, it's not fixed. You had some fixed stuff. I mean, you had the Moists with their utility, uh, maybe Han Fei, you know, if you, um, if you disobey the emperor, I kill your whole family, this kind of, he didn't last much, that kind of stuff didn't last much uh, longer than 30 years. Um, it, it was in this domain, the early uh, Western ideas, and they didn't know they were Western at that time, shall we say, it was also in this range, uh, taxonomies, in Aristotle, uh, when um, Plato said that uh, beauty, all beauty must refer to the mean, he was talking about an understanding of proportion that's not mathematical fractions, but again, a proportional a fit uh, with the cosmos. Uh, yes, in measured ways, but it was a fluid uh, kind of propositional uh, fit. This was all, oh, and, and by the way, uh, you have Aquinas saying in the 13th century, what exists is true. Isn't that amazing? This is a, the leading scholar, the 30th, 13th century, what exists is true. He says then in Soma Theologica. You try getting tenure on that type of discovery now. 
Uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, uh, why? Because the, the focus of these early ideas all were uh, motivated by the wonder of being. What is this? What is this that we're in? This wonderful, why are we here? I mean, this is the discard, this is the, the, you know, uh, the focus of early ideas. You have, uh, I'm just gonna pick on Luther a little bit in 1517 or thereabouts. You've got sola scriptura. Um, what this is, it's a, it's a departure, let's say from the being of the church uh, into propositional facts, the Bible as propositional facts. Um, I, um, I, I don't need the being of the church. All I got to do is figure this, this out uh, by propositions, fix them, and uh, I'm saved. Um, this is the sort of the time when Western ideas move to this direction, uh, where you've got um, Francis Bacon extracting out information out of nature to, uh, for our comfort. Uh, you've got uh, Descartes' very interesting formulation. Uh, we're so used to it that we don't un really understand how grasp how, how really strange this idea is. That you don't even exist until you think you do. Uh, your being does, isn't even there until you think it does. It is. I, this is a, a really odd idea, but it's now uh, so much our currency that we just think it's part of nature. Um, uh, Dr. Clark mentioned Langer uh, yesterday. Um, the, uh, uh, this is the rationalizing of classical architecture, and this is why you have neoclassical architecture. Neoclassical architecture is a bit stiff. The reason why it's so stiff is because, and it doesn't have the living fluidity of the classical, regular, the earlier classical work, so because it's been rationalized, it's been measured. It's been formula, for, uh, it's been formula, formulized. Um, and then I believe it was Dr. Cummins who mentioned J.N.L. Durand, J.N.L. Durand, who turned architecture into a rationalized kit of parts. I think it was Dr. Cummins who mentioned this yesterday. Um, well, lo and behold, uh, Liang Sucheng, who is the, recognized as the father of uh, Chinese architecture in the 20th century and uh, there you go, a product of Penn Architecture School. Uh, his pictorial history of Chinese architecture is also a kit of parts. Um, it, uh, it, uh, it, it, he, he brought all of his Western propositional taxonomies with him back from Penn. He did his European tour, went back to China and became uh, the father of uh, modern Chinese architecture. It, it is well to re remember that the idea of architecture as a profession did not exist in China until the end of the, uh, the 1900s. So, so when we talk about architecture in China, we're, we're dealing with, with all kinds of threads of um, stuff here that, um, that expresses itself in what I call Chinese modernity. But this is, this is uh, a knowledge-based uh, view of uh, research of knowing, and um, it is quite actually quite curious when you when you look at it from the broad uh, scope of time that that uh, I'm trying to show here. And I just want to put this in as a commentary. Where embedded in this knowledge based uh, way to know is uncertainty. It shows you how uh, unstable this way of knowing is. You've got Saussure and his arbitrary uh, notion of linguistics. This has moved on. There's a, you can pull this thread right through to today's critical theory, uh, the, the idea that conflict is basic ontology. That not only society is comprised of competing power, institutional powers, you and I ourselves are no more than competing intersections of Contradictions. This is where it's headed, and I mean, frankly, um, I'm, 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 you know, it's it's going to be for the next uh, phase of you know, Christian thinkers to to think this through, and um, uh, in the next, let's just say, in the next five hundred years. 
But again, uh, it is in this modern setting that architecture became decorative. And I wanna say this, I wanna say Chinese modernity is characterized by decoration, characterized by cosmetics. Um, in architecture, this is um, very profound because you have major institutional buildings now being designed uh, in a cosmetic way. This is, of course, as you all know, this is the Shanghai Museum. And what was the theoretical uh, force behind this? They made it look like an ancient Chinese uh, vessel. I, th this, uh, this is because it, uh, Chinese architecture has no long tradition of architectural thinking, linking its built forms to profound ideas of being that, um, that we have uh, in the West. And it is within this stew of things, this percolation of things that the Konstantin Greshnik conversation comes in. Um, you know, he, I, as I say, the, 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 uh, he did a great job, but uh, he did a great job in a cultural ideological uh, 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 atmosphere in which function became an issue every architecture expression must express a function. This is totally foreign to Chinese architectural roots. This is why Buddhism, when it comes in, it becomes Chinese and it's expressed in the Sihe Yuan. This is why Islamic architecture comes in. I'm really looking forward to what Dr. Steinhardt will say about this. Uh, it, it, it's expressed in Chinese ways. The, the uh, index uh, to, to to the single form of Chinese architecture, which is the, the Suhoyan. I will get into that a little more later. But um, he did a great job. But this is a, a, the modernist project of fitting a function into a form. Fitting a function into a form. This is uh, how you fit the train station into a form. Um, this is uh, one of the five, 10 great buildings uh, in 1958 that the Chinese government um, so this is the Beijing Railroad Station done by another Penn graduate, I might, I might add. And uh, Dr. Clark said, uh, made refers, reference to the Chinese mouths, you know, the, the little cap, that uh, the wonderful Chinese uh, roof had become, uh, I believe it was um, Tanizaki in his In Praise of Shadows, says that the Asian roof is a canopy that is hung from the sky. Um, and there you have it reduced to a mouth on a, on a train station. This is fitting a function into a building which is completely new to Chinese thinking, completely new. Um, every, every, every shape, every function has to have a shape associated with it. This is a clearly a Western uh, industrial revolution uh, innovation. And so uh, Dr. Kuhlman's fourth category yesterday, constructing a rational modern building with a Chinese roof. And, and there you have it uh, right there. The challenge to uh, Chinese architecture, I, I would say from an architectural theoretical point of view, indexed to philosophy and theology is that um, it, 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 it Modern Chinese architecture is nothing but decoration, because it has no, it has not been indigenously rooted in that. I, this just occurred to me. I just have a chapter coming out in a book where I argue that um, the Ch Confucian philosopher Shunzi, who uh, famously famously said that um, human nature is evil and therefore was avoided most almost throughout Chinese ideological history. If we were to turn to Shinzu and talk about how he talked about how human character can be molded as, as a technique similar to bending wood, uh, we would have a different kind of um, uh, architecture in China because we can draw from indigenous ideas. But it hasn't, it's, it's borrowed um, decoration from the outside. Let's talk about the vivifying principle. Um, what does 
Greshnik mean by nature, the single vivifying principle that the Chinese uh, and Chinese culture have always had? And I, I had a real, lot of pleasure thinking through this and my, uh, with the realization that uh, many of the Chinese philosophical technical terms that have informed the culture, all of them index back to this uh, this sort of very complicated notion of what we translate as, uh, as nature. And um, the, the, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to uh, sort of get uh, into this too, too much, but um, this, this uh, notion, for example, which came into uh, prominence in the early, in the Zhou period, um, this is not sky as it's often, I mean, it, you could use it as sky, but this is you and me in proportion to the workings of the cosmos. And if, if, if you don't act in proportion to the cosmos, if you don't, for example, um, uh, practice the portion that you have been given by protocol, if you don't do that, you, you trespass nature. And bad things will happen. Like a big earthquake in 1976 that, um, that stopped the Cultural Revolution. It was the year that Mao died. Bad things will happen. If you, if you trespass your portion, your fin or your fin, I mean, either way, uh, uh, Ken will not be pleased. Um, and so, and, and so you, you have to stick with your original nature. And let that original nature be spontaneously worked up um, and, and not have any type of intentionality. You know, this is usually translated actionless action, which I, I find to be a little uh, kind of confusing. I call it nature flowing through you. Nature, let nature flow through you so that you can, you can have nature's virtue expressed and other people will revolve around you. So therefore be respectful. Be respectful, um, and I, I, I mean, there's so many. And, and Dr. Clark, one one way to think about that Chinese philosophy class um, is to actually trace um, understanding understandings of nature from early times through today uh, in the Chinese case. I mean, that's one way to sort of frame that class. Anyway, um, the the Sung, Sung philosopher uh, Zhu Xi had a wonderful picture of, of the Sung notion of, uh, well, the Sung revival notion of Li, or Li, is um, the, the, the moon and the reflection of the moonlight on water. This is not two things as we scient scientists would think about. We, 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 think, we scientists would think that the moon is one thing and the reflection, oh, that's just something else. Uh, Li is in both. I mean, this is a wonderful integration of nature that you and I ought to be part of as Chinese science. This is the this is the vivifying principle of Greshnik thought through philosophically. Um, so um, Chinese architecture embodies the history and traditions of China. This architecture is largely a religious conception. I think religious is a Western notion there. Uh, inspired by nature and the reverential instincts of the human heart. Human beings and nature are not apart from each other. And it is expressed in the natural elemental quality inherent in Chinese architecture that comes from the steadfast cling to ideals of domesticity, the profound sacredness of family life. Uh, the, the, um, no, in no other system for philosophy that I, at least in the little knowledge that I have, is family, Jia, uh, raised to the level of a metaphysical principle, only in Chinese ideas. And so this is why Chinese temple hall constitutes as a rule, an ensemble uh, of edifices. It's a family relationship. This is, this, is the vivif this is part of the vivifying principle of Chinese uh, architecture. It is uh, seldom see anything noteworthy from architecture. The reason you don't see anything noteworthy from architecture point of view, because if you do point out architecture as a significant thing, it is removed from the fabric of your regular natural Zilan existence. Um, they make no effort to restore an edifice once it has fallen into decay. I'll show you a little picture of it. The roof is the tent of heaven. This echoes uh, Um 
And it's horizontal, meaning that the relationships that you have with your family members, it is on earth, it is with one another. The city is one vast garden, the charms of nature into the very heart of the metropolis. So everything is woven into this, uh, tian is everywhere. Ziran ought to be everywhere. Uh, and to be your best in your, in your li, uh, you better, you better have nature flow through you. You better be, uh, you better be uh, Ziran. Anyway, uh, and with respect to this, um, uh, I think it was Greshna who commented, gosh, these guys, I mean, they just leave, they, they just leave ruins. They never think of fixing it up. Well, excuse me. I mean, this is what, this is what nature does. It, it's a profound, it is a profound uh, demonstration of how Chinese life is in step with nature. I mean, it's only in, in the Western notion that as again, uh, I'm thinking of Kanazaki this morning, he says everything in the West has to be shiny and new, you know? Well, who says it does? This is a profound celebration of, of our communal life in the processes and the cycles of nature. Anyways, I'm getting a bit excited here. Um, so uh, what would a church look like? Well, I'm thinking of the hutongs and I'm thinking of uh, the, the, the perennial absorption of uh, religious ideas into uh, Chinese form. And it would be, it, I would say it's something like this. It, um, it, is, it is the same language, uh, the, all of these uh, terms, uh, all of these understandings of nature converted into architectural form. Here you have it in plan. It would just be in a street, in an alleyway in the Hutong neighborhood. Uh, I'm being a little idealistic about this because most of this stuff has been torn down in Beijing. But um, and in, in, in section, you have, you have something like this. Uh, we could incorporate the, the ta or the pagoda, which Dr. Steinhardt has already um, reminded us that this is a foreign input import. But as with anything else coming into China, we can make it Chinese. Uh, we could, uh, we, and it has been made in the Chinese. Think about the, what is that in Xi'an, um, that Buddhist, I think they call it, uh, I forget, uh, the, the, the wild goose pagoda, and, and it's got this tower in it. Um, uh, and, um, um, it could be easily incorporated as a vertical principle, uh, or what I call Jacob's ladder, uh, in a Christian uh, in a Christian setting. So it might look something like this. One thing that I think about is that the uh, the congregate the. the the, the, the cross could be uh, axialized uh, as a pattern. The uh, uh, meeting assembly, which uh, held true many times uh, for centuries in the West, could be by groupings, not necessarily seated, but by in family uh, clusters. Um, the, the altar and then a, a baptismal. The, um, it could, it, we could we could adapt this thing and 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 have it be uh, Chinese. The uh, this is a squatters village uh, uh, that I've visited, and um, it's about a two-hour drive outside of Quiming. And the missionaries have have put in a line for clean water, uh, uh, a latrine, uh, various methane tanks for cooking and heat. Uh, the practice is to go out there, buy food along the way, and upon arrival, uh, have the meal that the family would cook, eating, uh, sitting on the dirt floor. Uh, it seems to me that the Christian message on the Protestant side, at least, it's all about conveying ideas and concepts. But my sense is that ideas and concepts in a Chinese worldview is by definition non-propositional. They're fluid. Um, they have no, they have negotiable boundaries and what is really needed is the Christian message express, expressed materially, which is to say sacramentally. Here a cross is achieved by paving uh, in local materials, binds the community of the disparate to, huts together. The vertical ladder, you can see it here in this section here, the vertical ladder uh, is constructed as a visual anchor, a place for connection to heaven. 
An air, open air assembly area allows for congregation. Ultimately, huts, the huts can be arranged into a courtyard axial system that while allowing for Christian practices is congenial to the Chinese traditional uh, uh, ensemble. Five so minutes. Uh, so I'm saying ultimately you could, you could uh, actually arrange to find material expressions for Christian community. That's great, Tony, I'm right on schedule. Um, in the urban areas, we talked about verticality yesterday. Um, verticality in the, is, in the secular sense is how Chinese modernity thinks of itself. There are countless housing towers, breathtakingly vertical. The urban church responds to this verticality comfortably by the verticality of the Christian message while the seating is stacked in tiers. Here the seating is arranged by family and by friendship groupings, horizontality emphasized by the pavilion motif with extended colonnades to evoke the meeting space as traditional courtyard. The cross pattern again, and the logistics of procession is present in the floor layout. Jacob's ladder again emphasized the Christianization of Chinese pagoda. Um, in this, both this as well as the courtyard scheme, this altar is in the front pavilion in particular, participatory with the assembly space. Look, uh, if, um, in the few minutes I have left, um, it is what it is, all right? The allowance of potentiality into actuality as is itself an expression of the creative spirit of God. This is neither a Western nor Eastern operation, but a universal reality. I think we should be very thankful for all of the church expressions that are ongoing now and have been in China. And I'm looking at this from a broad um, Christian philosophical theological perspective. And I appreciate the historical uh, details that everybody else has, uh, has been giving us. But uh, in moving forward, we might have churches that look like this. Um, based on the computer cyber epiphore. We may have uh, something that looks like this in which the Christian church architecture in China moving forward, we might need to think of how Greshnik's vivifying principle uh, as, as it makes its way through these traditional indigenous Chinese ideas may end up looking something like this. Thank you. Professor Wang, thank you so much. We'll just immediately trans, uh, transition into the response by Professor Ireland. So Professor Ireland, um, we welcome you to the virtual podium. Well, thank you very much. Um, let me just get everything organized here. Good. Well, let me tell you three brief stories and then connect them to this marvelous presentation that Professor Wong has given us today. First, 10 years ago, I participated in a project that sought to, to find and record new spiritual movements in Southeast Asia. An ethnomusicologist was asked to track down new and indigenous Christian songs that were emerging in the region. So he crisscrossed Southeast Asia, including a trip to Irian Jaya, the Indonesian side of New Guinea. He traveled for several day, days there on foot, climbing narrow mountain paths, eager to record the Christian music surfacing in the Aryan Giant highlands. But what a disappointment it was for this Westerner to discover that the remote and tiny village he had journeyed to had only one electric generator, and it was fired up but once a week to power an electric guitar so that the congregation could sing loudly and enthusiastically Christian pop music that was playing in North America and Australia. Second story, I had a Chinese international student working on a project with me at Boston University who became curious about Christianity. On one of his trips home, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting my little thing here. There we go. Back we go. Um, so the student on one of his trips home, he decided to visit various churches and talk with pastors and priests and he returned to Boston enthusiastic about his discoveries. He was especially impressed, he told me, with the Sacred Heart Cathedral in Guangzhou, which to him exuded something like holiness. My students' admiring comments about the church building were clanging about in my head as I read Kresnich's verdict on such buildings. 
no form of Western architecture does more violence to the mute language of the soul of China than its most complete antithesis, the Gothic architecture of Northern Europe. And now finally, third, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to visit the first exhibition of Chinese Christian art in the United States. During the event, a lively debate broke out among a dozen or so artists who had managed to accompany their work to the US. One collection of, paint, of paintings had been done by a man trained in traditional um, Tibetan artwork. And his paintings were almost universally loved by the Americans who visited this exhibition but despised by all the Chinese artists who were present. When asked why, the Americans cited the, the Tibetan painting's authenticity, whereas the Chinese artists insisted that using traditional methods only distorted the Christian message. To them, Chinese and Tibetan cultures were poisoned by non-Christian elements, or maybe they were even under the control of demonic forces. Christ freed them to escape their cultural past. So why would an artist choose to be enslaved to it any longer? In all three cases, there was a noticeable disappointment among the Westerners. People like me, we wanted to hear or see something that expressed the genius or the spirit of another culture. But we found time and again that the quote unquote authentic culture that we were seeking was a figment of our imagination, something that the people in Southeast Asia and China themselves did not embrace. And that same feeling came to me when reading Gresnicht. I saw that same modified cultural paternalism, the pervading sense that somehow Gresnicht and I have the ability to judge and determine what real Chinese culture is and can insist that Chinese people live according to it. So what am I to do? Must I give up hope of seeing anything truly Chinese, something recognizably other? And here enter Professor David Wong, and he gives me at least three pointers to move past this place where I keep getting stuck. First, Professor Wong insists that Chinese culture is big and expansive. He gave us this mar whoops, sorry, this marvelous um, graphic that shows the variety of ideas and practices that have shaped Chinese culture over thousands of years. And look how much of this he claims is Chinese. It's all of this fluid and structured and propositional and it, it can all be Chinese. Such a broad vision undermines Kresnik's temptation to elitism, his inclination to dismiss the overwhelming majority of Chinese buildings that occlude the, the one or two truly interesting sites in a city, I believe he said. That is the few places that conform to his image of what real China should look like. I think Professor Wong reminds us that that view is too narrow. It is all Chinese. And similarly, this same chart challenges the temptation to lock Chinese culture into time. Kresnich used phrases such as since time immemorial to describe Chinese culture. But Professor Wang reminds us that that's just nonsense. China's not static and nor is its culture. The irony of the Catholic Church's push for indigenization in the 1920s and 30s, of course, is that it tried to enshrine a Chinese culture that was already passing away. The new culture movement exposed the church's essentialist vision of Chinese culture. The church only wanted to preserve the, preserve the spirit of old China and its more comfortable Confucian ethics rather than deal with new China and its modern values. But I'm grateful to Professor Wong here at my first point for reminding me that we cannot pick and choose so easily. It might all be Chinese. Second, Professor Wang, talk, his talk reminds us that the spirit of Chinese architecture that Kresnich observed was nature. That was sort of the, his critical observation, this one vivifying principle of nature. But nature is too small of a term in English. Professor Wang reminds us Chinese has a, a range of meanings for nature. Something like 16 words can be interchanged with this idea in English of nature. 
And therefore, this animating impulse that Chreznech identified is richer and more diverse um, than his insightful, but rather simple formula suggests. Any temptation to boil Chineseness down to maybe one idea, nature, will always risk blinding us to its diversity and especially to its contradictions. David Wong seems to whisper to me as I watch this presentation, Daryl, don't be too quick to crown any one thing as truly Chinese. There might always be more. Third and finally, Professor Wong beautifully illustrates how jumbled, overlapping, and even divergent impulses within Chinese culture can still speak coherently. This is important to me. Look at his attempt to answer the challenge to build a church in the Chinese spirit or the qi. The result holds together what I have been groping toward. It has some of the elements that Chreznech wanted to idealize as truly Chinese. We see the horizontal stacking, the family courtyard, the seamless connection between the garden and the building, etc. Yet at the same time, I think Wang gives us subtle elements of the cyber epiphore, which belongs to contemporary China just as much as the familiar courtyard scheme. So I'm grateful to your presentation, uh, Dr. Wang. You have helped give me some tools to revisit those stories I opened with. You invite all of us to expand our vision of Chinese culture, be attentive to its diversity, and yet trust that it is more than incoherent chaos. This wild mixture percolates and can beautifully and creatively express a culture's spirit or its chi. Thank you. Professor Island, thank you so much for that response. Um, first, well, the, before Professor Wang responds to your um, remarks, I should say that I, I am confronted with a very delightful conundrum. I have an overwhelming amount of uh, questions, both in the chat section and privately. So I'm going to try and wade through as many as I can. I think that the number of questions now, it's always the case in a symposium, the second day and the sort of third and fourth days, however, in, in sequence, the question numbers seem to rise. Uh, but uh, Professor Wong, first, I'll just uh, give you some time to respond as you wish to Dr. Ireland's remarks. Well, first of all, uh, Daryl, you are very kind. So um, I, I didn't realize all my humble presentation. Don't I sound Chinese, my humble presentation? Anyway, uh, I didn't realize my uh, presentation uh, uh, has that amount of significance, but, but thank you for your comments. Just uh, real quick, um, the idea that Chinese uh, preferences are for Western expressions. Keep in mind that when Lao Tzu made, um, uh, made sainthood, if you will, uh, he did not ascend up, he went West. Uh, what I mean, what I'm saying is that the, there's a preoccupation in China with everything from the West being, uh, being better. And uh, that, that's part of the, I, you know, it's, it, it, I think it's, it's uh, Lake Qing where this happened, um, where everything that came into China by force of arms, quite frankly, um, was better. And uh, there's uh, the whole tea and Jung uh, controversy. They wanted to hang on to tea and, and just deal with the Jung from these Western devils. And they, what they found out is that there might, wasn't much tea left. Uh, after the Jung takes over. There's a, there's a fascination with the, with the West that I think as China matures, uh, it will reach, it, as it looks to its own indigenous fabulous uh, philosophical roots. My hope is that there might be a, a little re revisiting of, uh, of that. So, so, um, so, so there was that thought that came to me while you, while you uh, responded to my thoughts, but I, uh, I'm, thank you for your very kind remarks. And um, I, I, I'm gonna defer to the questions that um, Tony has after this. Thank you very much. So let's, let's, let me begin with um, a private chat question and then I'll just uh, begin with the open chat question. So this one's sort of two part and it, it seems to be rather functional. So. This question responds to your Hegelian notion of Geist, of a spirit, and it says that uh, Hegel's Geist would have suggested that your presentation responds to a Geist unimaginable, 
to Costantini and Grezhnev. Um, so can you reflect on how Grezhnev and Costantini might have attempted a quote, Chinese architectural, a, a, a quote, Chinese Christian architecture if they were suddenly transposed into the Geist of the 21st century, the, the Geist of, from which you are speaking? That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, you're the first person of the presenters to propose a Chinese church design and actually to draw yourself a proposed Chinese church design with the Sikha Yuan courtyards and, and the Jacob's Ladder sort of re revised pagoda. But you didn't, uh, you didn't include any cosmetic. So what would your cosmetic be? You, you show a floor plan, but what would the cosmetic, like what would your facade be? That's the question. So basically, Grezhnev and Costantini suddenly being plopped into this modern Geist uh, and then, and then, what would the cosmetic look in your proposed church? Those are two parts, I guess, of the same complicated question. Yeah, a complicated question there. Well, uh, to the second half, um, my own view of architecture is that uh, cosmetics is a is an industrial revolution innovation, and to do to do any kind of architecture that's genuine architecture is uh, I don't see it as there ought not to be any decoration. It's all essential, and that needs to be. Uh, teased out when we talk about specific buildings. The, uh, thank you for saying that the Sihu uh, solution to the church has no cosmetics. Well, thank you, it doesn't have any cosmetics um, because it's a reflection of uh, the Chinese ideas of nature and its various forms. Let's move on to the first part of the question. Um, the, the, um, what would uh, Greshnik and, and uh, Constantine do in the 21st century? Well, I, I like to think that my closing slides um, touched on some of that. I mean, my own view is that the cyber epiphore is the, is the opportunity that we have to bring uh, these disparate lines of Western ideas and, and uh, Chinese ideas, I shouldn't say Eastern, but Chinese ideas are, are to the East what Greek ideas were to the West. Anyway, um, that uh, the cyber, cyber expressions like it or lump it are gonna be expressions of cultural commitment and ideology moving forward. And I think it's very uh, fruitful to think through the uh, Chinese, traditional Chinese philosophical categories uh, like Tian, um, like Li, uh, um, in, in, in ways that could be comprehensively expressed by the, uh, by the cyber, cyber epiphore. And, I, and so in one sense, what would I do if I heard if I received Constantini's um, um, charges, I would, I would, some of those later slides. Now my students are a lot better with this computer stuff than I am, but, but this, this, this underlines the, the dilemma that we're in right now. We're coming into a third epiphore that uh, only the young people understand. You know, I mean, I have to wait till my sons come home to, uh, to help me uh, work my DVD, you know, kind of thing. But um, uh, anyway, or at least Apple TV. But anyway, um, so moving forward, we have an opportunity, we have marvelous opportunity to see what these uh, the cyber, the cyber vivifying principle could do for Chinese architecture. So I would say if in the 21st century, it wouldn't look like that sort of end that I drew. Um, it would look more like this other thing that I have at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Let me. Um, so now we have two questions from theologians. One of the exciting things, and we did this intentionally, is to include a very, a, a very diverse admixture of views to approach the same topic. So, uh, Dr. Easton Law uh, mm -hmm. asks this. This is so. First, it's it's of customary, I think, of scholars to begin with a, a compliment and then have a question. This is a really fascinating overview of the deeper philosophies that trend through our forms. I would love to hear Dr. Wang. I would love to hear Dr. Wang's opinion of contemporary churches like the Haidian Church in Beijing or the Chongyi Church in Hangzhou, both of which move away from traditional forms of church but retain decorative elements. How do churches like these fit into your schema? And what do these forms say about the three self Chinese church's role in Chinese modernity? So that's a question uh, coming from a knowledge base that's beyond me. I, I, first of all, I have to look at these churches and experience them before I can I can comment on it. 
um, how do I how do I answer this question? I, I think that uh, we can we could say that uh, architecture is in transition. There's a, most architecture most architecture you can look at, especially in in the West and also in this new modernity that China's experiencing. You can un look at any building as a transitional element. Um, rather than the, a fixed thing at that particular time, it represents a transition in ideas from what was before to what where it's headed. And um, my my suspicion is that when we look at these, when I look at these churches, I, I probably could be able to comment on um, what what is of the past and what is of the future that's reflected in these forms. So, but beyond that, I, I have to plead ignorance because I haven't looked at these churches and don't know what they are. So then, well, uh, let's move to Professor Stephanie Wong's question. This architectural concept of the epiphore yeah. is fascinating and useful for thinking about the characteristic ethos of a people, place, culture. Yep. Could you say a bit more about the architect's regard for epiphores and change? For example, would you say that change brings about a sequential change in epiphore, where one overtakes another, sort of uh, in the vein of Kuhn's picture of paradigm shifts? Or would architects say that the epiphores themselves are undergoing some sort of internal transformation due to external factors? So there's a summary of the question. I guess I'm wondering uh, this in light of yesterday's conversation about trying to periodize or categorize yeah. if and when a hybrid Sino-Gothic architecture arrived on the scene. I just love these uh, uh, questions, which could uh, lead to academic papers. Um, um, let me just say about Thomas Kuhn, you, you touched on it. Um, was that you, Tony, or did Stephanie use Thomas Kuhn as, a, as an uh, example? Um, Thomas Definitely. Kuhn, yeah, sure. So, so Thomas Kuhn gives us a very you know, good insight that when, when scientists in his case, but I would say, in fact, I wrote a paper on this. Um, designers working in a particular established style. Um, they, are, they do what scientists do. What Kuhn says scientists do is that they are basically solving crossword puzzles. I mean, the, the framework has already been made and nobody doubts it, you know, and the, and the, when, the, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the sun revolved around the earth, everybody solved solutions based upon that presupposition. Nobody questions it. Um, when and and so I would say in broad broad terms of stylistic uh, practice, everybody works in it of basically solving crossword puzzles. They don't change things. It's when when something of a tipping point happens when things do change, that becomes an internalization of an external fact. Um, and so I would say that the cyber epiphore in China, the reason why I argue that it is not foreign to China is because there are hosts within Chinese ideas that could absorb this thing and make it Chinese. For example, the, the Taoist host that made Buddhism really Chinese, right? During the uh, uh, post Han period, Han dynasty period. Um, there, are, there are mechanisms within Chinese terms, Chinese ideas, that can absorb this, this uh, cyber epiphore. In fact, they're doing it better than most of us here already um, uh, with you know, computer printed houses and all that. Um, so, so that's when, a, ex when something external represents a tipping point in the Kuhn, and that's the structure, that's the revolution. I mean, that Kuhn talks about. And I think we are part of that revolution now in architecture. A, a revolution which embraces both East and West. I don't know if that answers your question, Stephanie, but I mean, at least I'm foaming at the mouth about it. So uh, we do need to, we, we scheduled a bit longer breaks today. So I'd, I'd like to uh, confirm one more question if, if, you, if you're willing to just go a couple minutes over. Um, there are so many more questions and I should note that in the chat section, there are links to uh, to uh, information about the, the Haidian church. I, and, yeah, I saw them, yeah. Right, right. Let me just end with, uh, uh, there's an excellent question here about the underground church, which actually questions, brings into question the idea of the aesthetics of church 
um, and that that brings us more into theology, ecclesiology. Yeah. So let me let me ask the question by Professor Joseph Ho: To what extent is the cyber epiphore an extension of the machine and human epiphores, as opposed to a form with its own independent agency? As my web developer spouse likes to say, "quote Behind every computer paradigm, there is a human programmer." And how might this new confluence of machine-created forms and human imagination complicate religious architecture of the future, whether in China, Asia, or elsewhere? Perhaps, Dr. Wong, if you could speak more about your analogy of the, quote, future church and the Shenzhen. So, so I repeat my observation. These questions are all topics for academic papers. And uh, Joseph, I'd, I'd love to co-author something with you on, on that. In terms of a short question, let me just say a little bit about the underground church. Uh, my, the, my, my mother came to faith in the ministry of Watchman Nee. Um, Watchman Nee was a major factor in uh, Chinese Christianity at the time of the, uh, uh, when Mao took over in 1949. Um, the, this particular theology uh, uh, does not take much stock in, in, in architectural forms. It's, meets in houses. It, uh, uh, um, so so uh, that's not an answer to your question, but I do think that th there is a way that uh, Christianity must be expressed in form, okay? A and for it to be totally uh, hidden, I think, uh, and this is a major change from uh, David Wang as a younger person, um, for it to be totally hidden uh, and meeting in homes and all, that may have worked in the second century uh, uh, West. And I'm not saying the third, fourth century, the, you know, the Basilica Cathedral is the solution, but, um, but I, do, I do think that it is incumbent upon us um, Christians, and, but also thinkers and, and um, um, scholars, I guess if you wanna use that word, um, to think through how the Christian uh, testimony could be represented in forms. And I think it's a profound question, uh, particularly with regard to the cyber app before coming, coming forward. So how's that for a non-answer? <laughs> it was a great answer. Um, I think every good scholarly answer ends with a semicolon. So there, there were lots of semicolons at the end of your answers, which, which is quite exciting. Yeah, and with that semicolon, we will take a break until uh, uh, half past which we will reconvene and, and take a very strong academic uh, turn into the domain of photographs and photography and the camera, and which we're very excited about. And we, will, we, will, we will sort of exit theology, uh, I think largely, and enter into history, which is more my domain. Um, but, but all these domains are exciting. Uh, Professor Wong, thank you so much. Professor Ireland, thank, Ireland, thank you for your wonderful response. Uh, we will now take a break and we will reconvene at half past. So thanks everyone.